This is Lone Star Community Radio on 104.5 KCZW LP Conroe and 106.1 KZCC LP Conroe and worldwide at IRLoneStar.com. Hey, this is Dick from Lone Star Community Radio. We have a big announcement for Lone Star Community Radio and our listeners. We have partnered with another TV station. That's right. You'll be seeing Lone Star Community Radio content on KVQT Channel 12 in the Houston area. Now is a great time to start a show or sponsor a show with Lone Star Community Radio. For more information on everything that is happening, visit us online at IRLoneStar.com or call the station at 936 647 3776 and leave a message. And we want to also wish everyone a safe and happy Thanksgiving. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Extension Hour. I'm Amy Ressler, County Extension Agent for Family and Community Health. I'm still getting used to that because it's a new title, Family and Community Health. And uh, we're really happy to be here today because I love doing the radio show when it's my turn. We take turns, everybody has a different turn. Um, and I often have guests, and today I have some awesome guests, and I'm so excited. So one of them is going to, like, walk in the door, like, any minute, and we're going to embarrass him and say hello when he gets here. But Eric Zimmerman is with me right now. So, Eric, introduce yourself. Good afternoon, Amy. I, pleasure to be here. Uh, Eric Zimmerman, certainly uh, uh, been in extension for quite some time as a county agent now, currently in Grimes County, previously served in Brazos, Lano, and Tom Green counties, way out west in San Angelo. And so... Graduated from Texas A&M and went into the extension program back uh, over 20 years ago and have, have enjoyed every minute of it. Yeah. So um, we do have a lot of um, experience. And when Philip gets in the room, we'll find out how long he's been. Well, no, you know what? I know. I know how long. Because we actually went to new employees orientation together. You did? We did. Yeah. And so we started. Were, weren't you even co-workers we at were, one time? Yep. At one time in... Um, Stevens County. I <laughs> just went blank. Where was I? Because <laughs> I've been Breckenridge. E- e- that's right. I've been. Come on in, Philip. Put on some headphones and join us. We're just. We were just talking about you. Your ears might have been burning because <laughs> we were. Um, Eric just introduced himself. Where he's uh, from. Where he's been. Where he's working now. I was talking about. Um, so I started out in Hale County. Um, well, I went to Texas Tech and then went to just a whole forty-five miles away from home in Hale County. And then I went to Stevens County, and that's where Philip was my coworker. And then I went to Bowie County, and then I uh, got my master's degree there in Texarkana, and then I went to um, the state BLT, Better Living for Texans office, and then I went to uh, Burleson County, <laughs> and I've been in Montgomery County. I've been too many places. Can't You've been all over been. the place. I have, yep. Yeah, I get around. <laughs> I've only been, I've been back and forth between East and West Texas. Yeah. Uh, you know, I call it just East Texas. Of course, people in this country don't call it that. But. No. <laughs> when you're from, from the western side of the hill country, uh, you certainly do that. But born and bred Aggie, obviously. Yeah, uh, obviously. You know, yeah. Even you guys are like a cult or something. No, well, it's a good one. It, it, <laughs> it's debatable. <laughs> anyway, Philip, say hi. Hello, Amy. How are you? I'm great. Glad How are you, you could make it. Let me turn my volume yeah. down. There. Okay, so okay. Philip joined us from uh, College Station. So um, tell us a little bit about you. Well, um, for about 22 years, I was a county extension agent, and as you said, I was your co-worker mm-hmm. for a couple of years over in Stevens County. Started my career as an assistant agent in Ellis County, then went to uh, Johnson County as a 4-H agent, Stevens County for about four years as the Ag and Natural Resources agent, and then for 15 years, I was a county agent in Austin County, and then I thought it would be a good idea to go get a PhD for some <laughs> strange reason. So uh, I was close to Texas A&M, so I thought, well, why not? So... Uh, went and got a PhD, finished that in uh, December of 14, and then took a job with the Organizational Development Unit, which is a, a, a unit in Texas A&M Agri Life Extension, uh, their own campus, and I, been, I was there for a little over two years. And uh, most recently, I am now the Regional Program Leader for Ag and Natural Resources. And that was kind of a surprise, like all of a sudden, like one day you're one thing and the next day you're the other, huh? Wow, was it? It was a big surprise to me. <laughs> Surprise. And in fact, I didn't. Uh, I d- didn't even apply. I just walked in uh, the wrong office one day. And said, this is what you're going to be doing. <laughs> oh, nice. So, uh, but anyway, it, it is. Uh, it is nice to be working in the districts again, as opposed to working in the whole state. Mm-hmm. And so, I'm real familiar with the southeast region. And so, it goes from Beaumont over to uh, Corpus, uh, 36 counties. And uh, I'm not real sure how many ag agents we have uh, in that region, but quite a few. Um, I know most of <laughs> a them. Lot. I know most of them just from my tenure with the with the extension service over the past you know twenty plus years. So, yeah. 
Well, we're glad you could make it on over to join us today. Well, I'm glad to be here, and I'm sorry I was a little bit late. Uh, I didn't account for traffic here in Conroe, <laughs> the greater Conroe metropolitan area. Yeah, sometimes there's sometimes the 105 is can be challenging, right? Did you come in on 105? I did, but I, I did take a little loop around, kind of, I think, maybe expedited the process. <laughs> I just followed my map, so that was uh, good. Ma- maps, they come in handy. Maps. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll think of that next time. Well, like I said, I'm really glad that you guys can be here today. I mean, you, you're two of my favorite people in Extension, so it's just oh, awesome okay. to have you here. Because um, often I usually I have um, like community members, um, di- different groups that we partner with, and we talk about some of the programs that have been happening. But I wanted to have you all here to talk about this awesome project that we have called Path to the Plate. Philip, tell us a little bit about how Path to the Plate got started and why we have it. Well, Path to the Plate was uh, the brainchild of uh, Dr. Susan Malabina. Um, and what she did after she became the executive associate director for Texas A&M Agri-Life Extension was she was hearing from different folks around the state, mainly, uh, well, a lot of commodity groups, and then uh, from agents as well, that uh, ag literacy uh, was a real challenge for a lot of them. Uh, there was a lot of misinformation that was coming about. No. Uh, yes. I, no, it's hard <laughs> to believe. Uh, misinformation uh, via, the, via social media, mm-hmm. uh, the Internet, uh, about where food is produced, how it's produced, and uh, how safe it is, um, was uh, being perpetuated uh, not just in, you know, uh, larger areas, metropolitan areas, but really in, in all parts of Texas, even in rural areas. Uh, folks are getting their, their news from different locations nowadays, and so that uh, that kind of stimulated that, that conversation. So uh, with that, uh, Dr. Balabina um Started a statewide initiative and uh, and asked me um, and um, another young lady named Julie Gardner to uh, co-lead this. So uh, and it was called Path to the Plate, and uh, we actually uh, sent out for a marketing firm and uh, to try to come up with a catchy name that uh, would would spark people's interest sure. in Path to the Plate. So. And then Eric and I were select- selected as Path to the Plate champions. We are champions. We are. <laughs> You want to start singing? Mm. We are the champions. Okay, so we won't sing. Um, So the the idea is let's train some of the people out in the field. Um, So, Eric, what was your first thought when you heard about Path to the Plate and being selected as a champion? You know, I think probably most importantly and what I thought was that this is something that's extremely important. And we Mm -hmm. see that when I was an agent in Brazos County, just uh, the young people that we try to educate through a program called uh, Pizza Ranch. Right. And bringing those fourth grade kids into uh, a general location to teach them where the ingredients of a pizza came from. That it wasn't from H-E-B, Kroger, or their local com- uh, community uh, farmer's market, things like that. It actually came from production agriculture uh, in the United States and more specifically Texas. Because you asked them, where does that milk come from? They, they think it comes from a jug. Yeah, from the and, grocery store. And so we actually, uh, you know, tried to educate them. Uh, on where the, the products of a pizza, an individual pizza, came from. And so it's something that we thought, you know, when I first heard about this, yeah, we, we need to educate our youth, and sure. we do that through the 4-H program, but it's something we need to do for all of our communities, uh, adults all the way down, because if we don't understand where our food came from or comes from, mm-hmm. uh, we're missing a link there. Sure. So just yesterday I was out at the Academy for Lifelong Learning. It is part of the Lone Star College system. Um, so all of the Lone, Car- and Lone Star campuses have this Academy for Lifelong Learning. It's actually for older adults. So they have to be like 50, 55 or older um, to be part of this program. So it's really, it's a, it's a very cool, <laughs> we are not 55. We're closing in. <laughs> but we're not yet. So um, anyway, it's a, it's a great program that they have for older adults. Keep them active, learning new things. They make this, you know, they have this whole catalog that they can choose from all these classes that they can go to. So I have this project that I've been doing for a while, this mobile cooking school. And so we teach folks about um, trying to get uh, basic skills on on cooking because that's one of the things, you know, you would think that everybody knows how to cook, right? But um, there's a lot more of us eating out because of um, just for for various reasons. And so some of these older adults, too, are... um, Newly single sometimes. I mean, I've had, in fact, one of one of the classes that I had, one of the gentlemen came up to me and said, thank you so much for doing this class. Then my wife passed away recently, and I didn't think that I could cook for myself, and you've shown me that I can. So I was like, oh, that was awesome. Anyway, so <laughs> I was doing this class yesterday, right? So we're talking about um, good nutrition, how to get 
you know, utilize my plate to get all the nutrients in that you need. And, and like one of the things that we're having today is strawberries. And so, you know, somebody raised their hand and said, well, what about, don't you have to worry, how do you wash your fruits and vegetables? Are you, can you put a little bit of like hydrogen peroxide in with it and wash it? And I was like, (laughs) no, no, um, you know, just good, clean running water and and some friction. We'll, we'll get that right off. So then that sparked a whole conversation about pesticides. And then, of course, we got into GMOs and we got into supplements and we got into um, food labels and mm-hmm. what's in this food and what should I eat. And so, you know, you had mentioned the young people, but even even older adults. Um, in fact, I told them to, to listen in today. So if any of them are listening, and, hey. And, and those are the key terms that we hear a lot about in, in the especially in the media and not just. TV and print media, but we talk about uh, social media as well. And so what are the truths? What are the myths? And that's one of the critical goals of us as agents within our uh, our counties and our regions that we've gone through this training of Path to the Plate is to address those issues, to educate people, make them or allow them to make their own decisions, but give them truthful, factual, and research-based information so they know when they have a question about pesticides or GMOs or the health and nutrition of a specific product, uh, even the labeling of the individual products, they can answer them questions themselves. Sure. Because it is very confusing. I mean, even really smart, educated people, it's it's easy to be misled <laughs> by some of that information that is out there because some of it, it sounds like, you know, it should, should make sense, right? And and I mean, even when you're well-educated, it's still sometimes questioning. Did you have something you want well, to say? Well, we have a whole lot of things going on in our society. Sure. You know, we have, um, we have, um, a uh, public that's uh, distrustful of a whole lot of things, uh, media, <laughs> the government, right. you know, and so uh, anytime that there, there's something out there that they do not, they do not understand, um, then there can be a backlash from it. So if you put in uh, big, big uh, chemical names into, into things, it may not be uh, anything to, to, to worry about, sure. but if you can't, you can't uh, spell it and you can't say it really, really well, uh, that scares people. From time to time, so and especially if they can't explain it themselves, and then typically they're going to be a little bit leery of it. Right, most definitely. So again, I'm so glad to have you guys here. Um, we're going to have to take a little bit of, of break, but when we come back, we're going to talk more about some of those things and explain those um, to help the people that are listening right now. So you are listening to Lone Star Community Radio 104.5 and 106.1, and worldwide on IRLoneStar.com. We'll be right back. Hispanic Chamber Connections with Dr. Carlos Sanchez, president of the Woodlands Conroe Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, featuring event announcements, member highlights, and more. Tuesdays at 1 p.m., broadcasting from the heart of Conroe, Texas, on IRLoneStar.com and Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1. Lone Star Community Radio is Montgomery County's radio station with talk, music, weather, and traffic for Montgomery County. Have a question, comment about one of our shows? Want to know how to reach a host? Just contact the station on IRLoneStar.com or call in and leave a message at 936-647-3776. Get involved with your community with Lone Star Community Radio. And we are back. How do you guys like our music? I see you like. I love it. It's nice, right? Absolutely. (laughs) So you are listening to Lone Star Community Radio. This is Amy Ressler, County Extension Agent for Family and Community Health. And uh, we've got Philip Shackelford, Dr. Philip Shackelford, because he mentioned, you know, he's got the That's PhD right, yeah. and all that, and he's moved on up. And then here's Eric Zimmerman, County Extension Agent for Agriculture and Natural Resources in Grimes County. So I'm really excited to have these guys here today, and we're talking about some really important things, talking about Path to the Plate. Um, so anybody that's listening, if you're interested in finding out more information about Path to the Plate, we have a website, and it's www.pathtotheplate.tamu.edu. Have you ever tried to Google it? Can you just Google Path to the Plate? Will it come up? Uh, yes, Maybe? you you can. Uh, well, you know, go ahead and do that, Zimmer. <laughs> All right, see so who gets it first. Um, All right, so Path to the Plate. And, and, and you can also go path to the plate.org, oh, and okay. that, will, that will lead you to the same spot. For awesome. some reason, they give us both domains. and So uh, we have we have that a lot with the A&M websites for sure. some reason. So, uh, But you can do the TAMU, path to the plate.tamu, 
or pathoftheplate.org. All right. And you'll so bring to the same place. TAMU is for Texas A&M University. Edu for education. So that's easy to remember. And it's the first O-R-G, one that pops up on Google. Organization is the TAMU.edu. Nice, so nice. Absolutely. Somebody's, somebody's doing that. a good job. Somebody in IT must be doing. <laughs> anyway, lots of great resources there, right? So for people yes. who are interested in finding out more, so we're we're going to talk a lot about um, some of the things that are out there. It, but it gets really confusing. Like we mentioned before the break, sometimes um, even if you're you know, well-educated, smart people still get really confused with some of that information that's that's out there because um, and so, uh, there's a lot of really good information out there. There's a lot of junk out there. What, what What's the, it's an example of something crazy that you've seen or heard out there, uh, uh, specifically with production agriculture? You want to start, <laughs> dun, 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 dun. I'll, Okay, I'll, I'll see it to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know... We have the opportunity to uh, do a lot of education with, um, you know, just anybody that comes to our programs. And I can remember several different instances uh, when I was a county extension agent, working with folks that uh, were highly educated and um, very learned and, and read a lot, um, uh, you know, challenging me on the uh, on the validity of how safe uh, our food products were. And um, at any given moment in time, we could be totally out of food in, in our in, in America. You know, with a, a few trucks breaking down, that we would uh, we'd, we'd all starve to death, um, which is not actually the case. Uh, there's food uh, we have a most well protected and safest food supply in the world, um, but uh, you know these were folks that you know were very learned and um, you know challenged challenged the validity of uh, say for instance GMOs. Um, I remember in particular I did a a course. Uh, through our uh, CEU program one time on GMOs and um, uh, was was challenged not with any factual information, but what was challenged with the fact that uh, they didn't believe the government was telling them the truth, uh, that, that it was actually yeah. safe to use. So, um, But if you look at the science and you look at, um, look at the things behind that, and it, it, uh, our, our, food, our, our production systems um, are well done and they, they are safe. And um, I think folks need to realize that. And uh, I think we have, uh, in in production agriculture and also in education, uh, per se, um, we've not been really uh, forward in telling people that uh, that their food is safe. Yeah. Um. So, research and science, I think, is an interesting thing. So, um, you know, there's a lot of research, and I'm doing air quotes mm-hmm. for people who can't mm-hmm. see research. You know, you, you can research anything. I can ask 10 friends what they think, and that can be, I can call that research, sure. but that doesn't mean necessarily that it's scientific. So there is a, a difference between research and science. What do you think, Eric? Well, I think so. I mean, you can always skew the numbers as you, you wish sure. in, in, in terms of a research project. But what's important to the things that we do is, is we refer back to research-based information at the university level that's unbiased. And right. so when we when we gather that information from our specialists on campus at Texas A&M, they're providing us information that we can relate to the public that's going to be unbiased and factual simply to get the information, the factual information for those consumers to make an individual, you know, an educated uh, uh, decision in relation to what they're doing. And so, you know, some of the issues you, you hear a lot of nowadays is, is, and you referred back to, you know, strawberries and things of that nature, you know, sure. pesticide residue, uh, genetic, genetically modified organisms, GMOs, mm-hmm. uh, even things that you see within uh, the pop culture or, or, or day-to-day life at the, at the, at the food counter and at stores in terms of labeling. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of those things are, are proven through research, especially the, the GMO issue right now. And so what we're challenged at uh, with it, within the United States more specifically is, is we continue to lose less or more and more acreage Right. Uh, in terms there's of land, so much land. there's only so much land, right. and, and we do that due to urbanization to and, 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 and urban sprawl and things of that nature. Right. But the population is not decreasing. We continue <laughs> to increase no. our population in the United States and worldwide. In the United States, obviously, we're a developed country, and so it's it's one of our charges that we've seen uh, and we've adopted and we've accepted to feed the world. And so, as we continue to do that, we've got to become more efficient, and we do that through technology. And that technology is proven through research-based information at the university level, not only Texas A&M, but all of our land-grant universities uh, throughout the United States. But, of course, with us and in, in, in being our proximity to A&M, we utilize that. Sure, and it can be complicated. I mean, it's it, it's a lot to take in. And 
um, a lot to, to understand. And um, in terms of research, I heard something the other day about, um, you know, we all accept that the world is round, right? Mm -hmm. But none of us really have the tools needed to actually verify that the world is round. So we have to depend on people who do have those tools and have the ability to actually verify that, yes, the world is round. <laughs> well, and kind of on that at that point in, in my previous point, too, we talk about technology in general. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, some of the points that we uh, were able to experience during one of our trainings was you talk about technology. How does it affect just our general lives? Well, you know, um, without technology, we wouldn't have as many advances in our medicine and our, our pharmaceutical industries that we see now to address those issues related to health. Uh, communication, you know, used to, you know, back in the day when the three of us were growing up, uh, we had rotary phones at our house and there were party lines in rural areas. And so now, you know, you don't see people without cell phones right. and, and you know, th those things. I always talk about when we talk about pesticide applicator training, there used to be a slide set that we would go through mm -hmm. and the agent did a lot of yes. talking. And so we went from the slide set to a VHS or a VCR tape. And, you know, that was when our agency was in a different name, but still, uh, we utilize that. And so we've talked less as agent. We just push the play button. And so then it chant, it got even more efficient uh, to a DVD player, a little less bulky, a little easier to utilize. And so as we progress through even that kind of stuff, we've changed over time. And, and technologies, you know, in, in our cultures, the same way. We used to utilize the oxen and, and a plow and walk behind that. And now we have high highly sophisticated technological advances in terms of equipment, in terms of things that we can utilize products within the ag industry that helps, again, feed the world. Right. Produce more food with less land. With less land, less input uh, in terms of labor. Absolutely. So, so that may mean sometimes using pesticides so that the food is available for people to eat as opposed to the pest to eat. Yeah, that, right. I mean, that, that's true. I mean, you have to utilize all those technologies. And I hearken back to what uh, Eric just said, and I, I can't help but uh, go back to my own childhood, the party lines and the, <laughs> the old lady that was down the down the road from us that would listen in on all the conversations. <laughs> but, yeah, and I think uh, folks sometimes wax poetically about the way things used to be and, uh, you know, how good things were way back in the day. And, and you know, really and truly, I, my, I to borrow a phrase from my grandmother, she said, don't give me those good old days. Um <laughs> You know, I'm living in them. So, um, you know, things were hard back in those days. And sometimes it was sustenance farming. Uh, wherever we grew, that's what we had to eat. And that was the only thing we had to eat. So, but technological advancements has um, has promoted agriculture now to where we're not only feeding ourselves, but we're feeding, you know, every farmer feeds about 117 folks. So, uh, on average. And, um, you know, we always say that America is feeding the world. Well, we're we're feeding a, a good portion of it. We're not feeding the whole world, but we're feeding ourselves and we're feeding, we're exporting enough where we're feeding other folks as well. Um, but we do have a lot of technological advancements that have have, uh, have made farmers more efficient and uh, have helped them help them to, to, to produce more. Um, and in fact, you know, since 1997, up until today, we've lost about a million acres of farmland. Uh, and that's due to, you know, land fragmentation, urban sprawl, uh, a whole lot of other things. And if you think about the where our metropolitan cities are, they're sitting right on the prime, best. Yeah, <laughs> prime farmland. That's the reason they were there to begin with. Because that's where the food was. That, that's where it would grow. That's Yeah, yeah so and, and so the markets there. developed there. And right. so and, and the, the farmland was right around those markets. Right. So, um, so in order to feed that growing world, which we're going to have, you know, we got about seven and a half billion people on the planet right now. Um, and, and, you know, just about every night there are about a thousand, not a thousand, um, but about a million kids that go hungry, you know, every night. So, um, and that's, that's a telling statistic. And um, so how are, we, how are we going to continue just to keep up? Um, What's going to take some technology to do that? Most definitely. So, yeah, when you think about uh, kids going hungry and, um, you know, it's, it's it's hard to for a lot of us to really understand what it means to, to go hungry. But, um, you know, without production agriculture, without producing enough food for everybody, I mean, that could be an, a situation that we could face. So um, things like pesticides and GMOs are actually important and play a really strong role in um, our future. Yeah, and, and, you know, we talk about GMOs. I, th I think that's probably one of the hot-button things. And, and 
GMOs are simply, you know, a uh, it's a technical technological advancement that's uh, used by ag producers, sure. and it's an advancement that's just not thrown out there. It's been researched. It's been justified. It, it, a lot of these companies that come out with products or, or, or uh, take, for instance, a seed company or something along mm-hmm. those lines, they're not going to put a product on the market that has not been proven to be safe, one. Right. Two, uh, they spend a lot of money doing that. And so they cannot be wrong. If they are wrong, it's it's a bad thing for that company as well. And so, again, those those farmers and ranchers utilizing those type of things, their hopes are to become more efficient and to address those issues that we see in terms of pests that attack products or crops right. because when we see those attacks the yield is decreased so the production total that acre of land let's say is less which ultimately means there's going to be less product for our, our population to 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 buy at the store mm-hmm. which obviously we've seen before as as uh, supply decreases price increases and we don't want that because uh, uh, philip had referred to earlier we've got the most abundant and economically uh uh, the cheapest food source in the world. And so we're able to do that through that technology. You know, on average, Americans spend about 6.4% of their annual income on food. Right. Um, you know, the next closest nation to us is Germany uh, on on producing food. And they, and they spend a little over 10%. And you can go up the line from there. And you can go up the line from there. And, um, you know, you have several can- countries that um, may have uh, experience, you know, some, uh, some unrest and you can correlate that right back to, uh, commodity prices or food prices when the, when it costs them more to feed themselves, that causes a lot of social unrest. And so, you know, America is very blessed in the fact that we, uh, we don't have to spend a whole lot on food. Uh, we have the cheapest, most abundant food supply on the planet. And therefore we have a, a pretty stable, uh, environment to, uh, you know, to buy disposable goods, to buy homes or to buy cars or, you know, to go out to eat. Or if we choose to, and if we choose to do this, we can buy organic and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, or we can, we can um, you know, buy non-GMO things and there's nothing wrong with that. If that's your choice, that's your choice. But uh, through the Path of the Plate program, we want to make sure that people understand what the facts are um, right. so they're not misled by uh, claims that, that aren't science-based. Right, right. We want people to make their decisions based on facts and not on fear. And to do research and understand what they're reading when they do that research. All right, so we have to take a break, but we're going to come back in a little bit. Let's talk a little bit more about GMOs. Let's tell people what those are and how to do research and to look at those kinds of things. So you're listening to Lone Star Community Radio 104.5, 106.1, and worldwide on IRLoneStar.com. And this is Amy Ressler, and you're listening to the Extension Hour. We'll be right back. Relax with a cup of joe or your favorite drink for the Conroe Lake Conroe Chamber of Commerce Chamber Chat. The show airs on the first Tuesday of the month at 11 a.m. on Lone Star Community Radio. Join hosts Courtney Galley and Brian Bondi as they chat about the Chamber's events and programs for the month and invite Chamber members into the studio to talk about their upcoming events and businesses. Learn about your Chamber with Chamber Chat every first Tuesday at 11 a.m. Don't forget to download the Lone Star Community Radio app from your Google Play or Apple Store. Bring Montgomery County's Community Radio with you anywhere with your smartphone or tablet. If you are in the Conroe area, tune in on FM. That's Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1. If you are on the computer, bookmark IRLoneStar.com as your internet radio station. A Lone Star Community Radio. Broadcasting 24-7 from the heart of downtown Conroe, Texas. And welcome back. You're listening to the Extension Hour. Philip was just making commentary on where people grow up and what's happening and different types. of. So we're, what were you saying? We're, oh, I just think it's unusual how you grew up in Lubbock. Uh, the hub of the South Plains. And then Eric is an old West Texas boy. I can't remember. Crockett? 
Menard. 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 Yeah, not, not Maynard. Not, no. But Menard. Menard. M E N A R D. Yes. Menard. Menard. Is that Crockett County? Menard County. Okay, Menard. <laughs> but it, I'm not that far I'm, I'm away. Trying to, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to give. I'm trying to give Crockett. That's D six. So, uh, and then I grew up in Cisco, home of the uh, big damn Lobos. Uh, we just had, we had, we had a big, big dam there. So, a and, and, yeah, yeah, it was, a, right. so D-A-M, <laughs> not a D-A-M. <laughs> but uh, this is, I know this is family radio, and here I am cursing. Um, but, <laughs> no, and that's out about the Abilene area, and it's kind of unusual how we all have found homes over here in, uh, not East Texas, but. Uh, South Central? South are we Central, central kind of Eastern, South Central. Know. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime, anytime where I saw a pine tree when I was growing up, it was always in somebody's yard. It never grew wild. So <laughs> right, well, yeah, Lubbock. There's only um, trees where people. But we just we had a bunch of those Afghan <laughs> pines out there just to control wind. Uh, yes, yeah, wind breaks. <laughs> Stuck them around the house. Yeah, exactly. But so Texas is a large state, lots of people, lots of land, lots of uh, production, agriculture, and that's kind of what we're focusing on today. Um, a little bit about Path to the Plate, which is a program that connects agriculture to health. And we haven't even mentioned a whole lot about health yet. Um, but that, I think that that's one of the fears that people have when they're thinking about their food and where it comes from and what's done to it. Like, oh, my gosh, it might, you know, affect my health negatively. And certainly health is a very personal thing. And um, people have very passionate feelings about their health and what they eat. And um, what we mentioned before, too, is... Um, it's important for people to make their own decisions, to, but to make those decisions based on facts and not so much on fear and to really look at um, the sources where they get their information because um, there is a lot of information out there that sounds really good. It may be based on some type of research, but it's not necessarily scientific. So um, we had mentioned uh, before the break that we would come back and we'd talk a little bit more about what are GMOs, how do you find good information, how do you do your own research. Um, so who wants to go first? Well, I can give you a little, just ge <laughs> some general things and, and it, you know, GMO, genetically modified organism. And right. so and somebody that said, scares, that scares oh, yeah. and just it does. Name. modified, and, 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 it's like going to make us all into yeah. like these, like three eyes. And so what is modified. that? Well, it's, it's, it's GMOs are a trait that enhances the crop that it's in, influencing. As an example, could be mm -hmm. a corn crop. Uh, there's about 29 different GM crops and over 400 combinations of different traits. So the primary uh, GMOs and crops, they, what's their function? One of the, the primary functions is uh, to resist specific diseases. And so, you know, a lot of times we, we see farmers that, uh, that lose crops to an outbreak of a specific disease. And so a GMO that's related to a specific disease can help prevent that crop, prevent that, ultimately uh, increasing the yield and, and going to market. Um, another thing is specific GMOs can restrict the, the incidence or any, uh, effect of individual pests within a, a cropping system. Uh, sometimes a GMO, uh, and one of the things that I think we probably most commonly are uh, familiar with is uh, some GMOs help to resist the, the harmfulness of specific uh, herbicides. An example would be Roundup Ready cotton, Roundup Ready type of thing. So it allows those farmers to go in and get rid of weedy species in a specific crop but that crop does not get affected by that Roundup product that's killing those unwanted plants. It's ultimately taking up water and going to be decreasing the yield. Yeah, GMOs are actually a technological marvel. I mean, if you really stop and think about it, that, um, you know, not too long ago, we didn't even know what DNA was. Right. Deoxyribonucleic acid. So, <laughs> Ooh, uh, we yeah, that. well, the doctor in me, you know, I don't know how to say that. Um, doctor. Yeah, okay. not that kind of doctor. I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but DNA, I mean, we've, we've isolated DNA now. We could isolate it in a whole lot of things. And so now, you know, GMOs, have, um, that technology is actually taking a little splice of DNA uh, molecules out of that chain and in, inserting a different type of DNA. Um, the first one, of course, was Bacillus thuringiensis, which sounds ominous too. Sounds like a you know you're speaking a foreign language. You're so smart. <laughs> yeah, but you know, but in reality, Bacillus thuringiensis was actually used as a insecticide in the 1920s by the French. Hmm. So it's been utilized uh, since then, and it's naturally occurring. Yes, and it's a naturally occurring soil bacterium, and that's that's the another neat part about it. It's all it's naturally occurring. It's already in the environment. 
and it's been occurring for years and years. And what it does is it, it affects the, an insect that would feed on that plant, and it causes it to die. And that's all it does. And what that does is it breaks the life cycle of that, of that pest population. And so in turn, what that farmer gets to do is he gets to rely on that GMO for that pest feeding on that, that crop. And whenever that pest dies, he doesn't have to go out and spray pesticides on that particular crop. And so in, in essence, what has happened since 1982, we've actually decreased pesticide usage across the board, um, especially insecticides in row crops. You talk about BT, you know, and of course, uh, was that that big word he said? Bacillus, bacillus <laughs> thuringiensis. Um, we're in an area. Obviously, we receive more rainfall than than maybe our hometowns. <laughs> Homes, <yeah. laughs> yes, so we definitely. Get, so, so we see a lot more instance of mosquito problems. Well, that product right there, marketed under different names. One of them it was called mosquito dunks. Well, what does that do? That's Bacillus thuringiensis that gets rid of mosquito larvae. So then we decrease the problems that we see in terms of mosquito infestation and the Zika virus and West Nile and all those kind of things. So does that talk about food and, and production agriculture? No, but it's still the same product, the same naturally occurring bacteria that we're utilizing all the time and encouraging people to use to control the mosquito populations mm -hmm. for human health. Right. Yeah, and it's been used, it's been used in, um, you know, as— as a production agricultural spray, you know, yep. for crops for since the 1920s, as I said. Right. So the so. question is, and we get back to health, Amy, right. and, and it's, it's, does GMOs affect the health rating, let's say, for lack of a better term, of a specific product? Or, does, in other words, does it, uh, does it affect nutritional content? Does it change those things within a, a, a cotton plant or a corn plant? Obviously, if we're going to be uh, utilizing corn, it, it does not. Mm -hmm. It just helps that producer be more efficient in growing their crop. And the, and what that means for me as the consumer sitting at home wanting to eat something, it means that food is going to be available. It's going to be safe. It's going to be nutritious. It's going to be um, there to, to, to feed and take care of us. So it, it, sometimes people get in their little um, bubbles and they, you know, think that the, it would, it's easy to feed the world with organics or, and, and as we mentioned before, or, there's nothing wrong with organics or um, non-GMO foods. Definitely that's a choice that people can make, but that may not feed the world. No, but and we talk about, you know, crops being healthier. Well, one of the biggest concerns is pesticide residue within crops. Mm -hmm. Well, GMOs allow us to reduce our pesticide use as agriculture producers because of the specific traits that they're selecting for in terms of a, a crop being resistant to certain insects. And so that allows that farmer to not utilize as, many, as much pesticide, which then in turn allows it to be even per, perceived even safer product over the counter when we go to buy our, our, our individual fruits and vegetables and things of that nature. Sure. So our discussion on strawberries yesterday was about, um, this, so strawberries are, they have the kind of the soft skin. So that's one of those things that um, there's some um information out there that says that that's like the top of the worst list of things that you can eat because of the skin in, in terms of the pesticide residue that's on there. But it would take a child um, would have to eat something like a thousand and twenty strawberries to get to a toxic level. I mean, and when, even when you think of the terms of um, water in excess is, is toxic. So sure, yeah. um, a lot of people kind of get um, out of the, the, I don't know what I'm trying to say. The, well, the dosage makes the poison. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, because, yes, it's there, but our bodies can handle that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, you know, and uh, you brought up a good point there that, you know, about pesticide residue. I mean, we, um, you know, the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, and USDA, um, uh, they help regulate um, pesticide residues. And they actually come up with thresholds um, where, um, you know, there are there is a certain amount that our body uh, can withstand, uh, you know, because a lot of these products are organic, as we as we already said. But um, so there there are certain thresholds that that uh, have to be reached before those 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 uh, particular you know produce or foodstuffs would be thrown out. But the, the take home message with that is that they are inspected, and if they're commercially grown, commercially produced, uh, sold, and you know, most stores that they are going to have to pass some form of inspection and which would, 
if there is if there's excess residue, they're going to kick them out. Um, you know, an interesting thing that I think you guys remember from um, from the training was uh, we showed a slide there of FDA and USDA um, and the residue uh, the residue checking policies and things like that and the amount uh, that was actually domestically grown and had to be kicked back um, because of, of pesticide residue. Mm-hmm. Uh, you remember what that, that number was? I do not. It was about 2%. <laughs> about 2% was, was all that actually had to be kicked back, So, um, which should lead you down the path that American farmers are pretty educated on following label directions when they utilize pesticides and uh, doing the right thing. Because, number one, if that product gets kicked back to, to them and gets thrown out, they lose money. Right. So they're not going to make any money. Uh, and, you know, number two, they want to do the right thing, and they don't want to hurt anybody. Um, they're, they're out there doing their job. They're out there uh, doing a good service to the public, which is feeding them. So um, they want to do the right thing. So... Um, in the long run, uh, we do have safety measures in place uh, to help prevent bad things from happening with pesticide residues. Sure. And Eric mentioned uh, pesticide applicator training, mm-hmm. pesticide applicator um, license. So anyone who applies pesticides to crops has to go through a lot of training and a lot of continuing education to make sure that they're up on the latest. So it's not like they're just, oh, let's spray our crops with some more stuff. <laughs> Maybe it's- that, that's right. You know, and, and to go through that, you know, obviously with with extension, Agronomic Extension, which is the entity that we work for, you know, we're the education base. But of course, TDA, Texas Department of Agriculture, is the regulatory agency. And, and so they're very involved in those kind of things. And in terms of allowing for those producers to acquire a license, if it could be a private, a commercial, or a non-commercial, but also investigating issues that could be a problem. And so they, they take that very seriously. Uh, and that's something that uh, we have in the state of Texas uh, and, and that we do in all other states, but something that we work with day to day with our TDA reps uh, as being a regulatory agency and, and us obviously being an education agency. Sure, sure. So there is, um, like we said, a lot of regulation, a lot of oversight. So the the, the chances of something really poisoning our food supply are, are, are very, very slim. And we would be, you know, we, we would be lying if we said it was absolutely impossible because it, it could happen. And sometimes there have been some issues that have been identified, but the, the likelihood of it happening um, is, is so small that it's really not worth the fear that some people experience or some people try to perpetuate um, in terms of, eat, of, of the food supply and, and the things that we eat. All right. So, We're going to talk a little bit more in just a bit, but you are listening to Lone Star Community Radio 104.5, 106.1, and I'm Amy Ressler, County Extension Agent for Family and Community Health. We'll be right back. Don't forget to download the Lone Star Community Radio app for your Google Play or Apple Store. Bring Montgomery County's community radio with you anywhere with your smartphone or tablet. If you are in the Conroe area, tune in on FM. That is Conroe's FM 104.5-106.1. The Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service has been dedicated to educating Texans for over a century. In 1915, the Extension Program was established under the federal Smith-Lever Act to deliver university knowledge and agricultural research findings directly to the people. Ever since, AgriLife Extension programs have addressed the emerging issues of the day, serving diverse populations across the state. Texans turn to Extension for solutions in horticulture, agriculture, 4-H and youth, and family and consumer sciences. Extension agents respond not only with answers, but also with resources and services that result in significant returns on investment to boost the economy. Join us Fridays at 1 o'clock for the AgriLife Extension Hour. This is the Extension Hour every Friday here on Lone Star Community Radio. Um, we are in beautiful downtown Conroe. Philip was just commenting on how, how lovely this area is. Um, so 
we're here every Friday, one to two, and um, we have different people who actually um, are here each week. So the, uh, the agents in our office take turns. Um, one of the things that I forgot to mention when we first started is um, we would usually talk about um, upcoming events and that kind of thing. So I want everyone to remember to tomorrow on November 4th, 9 to 11 a.m. at our extension office, 9020 Airport Road, we will have an open garden day. So it's kind of like um, open house, but it's the gardens. And um, we're talking some about pesticides and um, herbicides and kinds of things that are put on plants, um, organic versus non-organic. Um, we have like 350 master gardeners here in Montgomery County. Wow. Yeah, and they, they're they they're awesome. They do great things. They uh, maintain the gardens around our offices, which are all um, demonstration gardens. So some of them have been treated and some of them have not. And we've got lots of people who are um, are basically experts in these kinds of topics. So they'll be on hand to answer questions that people have. So we've got um, ornamental gardens, and then we also have vegetable gardens. We have herb garden, we have trees. Um, so just a wealth of information. And 9 to 11 um, at 9020 Airport Road in Conroe. And um, we're going to be there. We're going to have some, I'm going to be there with Family and Community Health Department. And we're going to have um, some food because we like to feed people. We, we make good food. So we're going to have some food samples. <laughs> I know you do. Uh, yeah, I've well, eaten your you food know, before. Yeah, that's that's how that you know sharing food with people is like kind of sharing your soul with people. Right. Anyway, so <laughs> come on out and see us. Break uh, bread your family, and, right? And we, you know, if you if you share a meal with someone or you share food with that is like family, yeah, and sure. that's yeah, most definitely. Sure. So um, and I, can I kind of say a few words here, Amy, before you before you get going? I know you had sure. a thought that was about to roll off your tongue, and but totally and it's going is you going to lose it right now, but. Um, I just want to tell the listeners how incredibly fortunate they are to have the staff here that, that they do in Montgomery County because you guys are phenomenal. You do great work of trying to get education out to the public. Uh, you've got a long tenure staff member in Mike Heimer, and you've got a fantastic uh, Master Gardener program and horticulturalists, and, of course, you, the family and community health agent. I know what kind of work you've done because you, you were my coworker for a time, and so um, – um, so I would encourage all of the listeners to uh, to embrace the extension message and uh, go out and uh, you know participate in one of the programs that are coming up because they do great work here and uh, fantastic. Ah, uh, well, thanks. And, and a, a segue to that, bringing it back to path to the plate. You know, the the training that we went through mm -hmm. as agents throughout the state, and there's 24 of us that they're covering basically the, the state of Texas. And our charge was to go out and and assist with educational programs are we going to come up with specific path to the plate only type of, of programs probably not but what we're doing is introducing the concept of path to the plate in those individual modules that we talk about in relation to pesticides and gmos and labeling and the economic impact of agriculture in texas all those type of things into already established programs that take for instance lions club meetings uh chamber of commerce meetings extension programs to non-traditional mm -hmm. audiences as well. Youth programs. I'm doing one for um, uh, Reggie Lepley and those folks over in Walker County at New, New Waverly. So a youth component as well in November. And so we've got those, those, those topics ready to go. And so if people would like to have us come to present those individual topics, no matter what it may be, we can certainly inject those into their individual programs that they've already got established. Most definitely. So I was talking about the Academy for Lifelong Learning, and I've got a class scheduled at um, – the one in Montgomery, as well as the one in New Caney about, um, do you know what's in your food? And we'll talk about food labeling and that kind of thing. So that one will be specifically path to the plate. Um, but then also, like I mentioned yesterday in the class that I was doing, I wasn't really prepared to talk about pesticides and GMOs and that type of thing. But people were interested and it came up and there were lots of questions. And I saw this and I've heard this. And um, so to be able to um, address that as part of our regular programming definitely is um, something that we'll do. So um, it's good to be good to be prepared. And just like every good county agent, you you always have an answer, right? <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> I, I try to be honest. If I don't know the answer, or if I'm not sure, you'll find it. Um, yeah, I'll definitely find that out. Um, be, because research and science is changing all the time. I mean, if we still, um, you know, went with the answers that we had 20 years ago when we started Extension, you know, some of those answers are not right anymore mm -hmm. because we've learned new things. Um, Research is always uh, teaching us new things, and we're learning new information. And so that's one of the, I think, the great things about Extension is that we've got um, that that knowledge base behind us where we can 
provide the most recent um, information to people that's, that really is truly reliable. So it's most recent. It's not trendy. It's not necessarily because somebody thought it was a good idea. It's really based on research. Yeah, exactly. And um, if, if anybody has the opportunity to hear Amy talk about food labeling, now that is probably the, one of the most enlightening portions that was for me anyway. And I, you know, I was one putting the thing on, but uh, the training that you guys went through, that was, that was a fascinating um, presentation that uh, Dr. Jenna Anding presented to you guys. And then uh, you guys now have the, that presentation to present to the general public. But, you know, we have a lot of misinformation out there of food labeling and it's not, well, maybe not misinformation. It's marketing. It's marketing. It's what marketing. It Absolutely. Marketing. So, um, and it, to, to actually have somebody sit down and explain what those labels mean and explain where they're coming from, uh, it, it is a, it, it's really a fascinating thing. So if, if Amy does one of those food labeling uh, presentations here in the next, I don't know, year or so, uh, make sure you mark it on your calendar and go to that and listen to that. Sure. Or if someone's listening and they want to have something like that for their group, we're, we're always responsive to requests. So definitely ask. And, and, you know, just a teaser, you talk about labeling may be the, one of the most interesting things mm -hmm. because it crosses over so many different things. And it, 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 it plays on emotions within uh, the consumer and going to the store. And example, I believe, what is it uh, you see on, on eggs, poultry, mm -hmm. you know, eggs that they're, they're hormone free. Right. Well, it's against the law to have any type of hormone in our poultry industry. And yeah. so they're all hormone free, but it's marketing labeling and right. something. So those are the kind of, that's the tip of the iceberg when it comes to those kind of topics that we can discuss. Right. Oh, in fact, yeah. you can look on the inside of the carton and it actually says that. <laughs> so. Exactly. Yeah. so that's kind of a, a teaser for future. Maybe you guys can come back and we can talk some more about some of yeah. um, these oh. topics because um, we were just mentioning during the break an hour is really not long enough. Um, it, because there are so many things that are out there related. So, um, yeah, Dick is saying wrap it up. It's time to get going. So um, thank you so much for listening today. Don't forget Open Garden Day today, uh, tomorrow on Saturday. And um, listen in every Friday. You're listening to Lone Star Community Radio. See you soon. Thanks for checking out this podcast of Lone Star Community Radio, Montgomery County's community radio station. If you enjoyed this recording, make sure to check out our past shows online at IRLoneStar.com or their respective video or podcast formats on YouTube, Google Play, or iTunes. If you have any questions regarding the show, either it being about sponsorships or questions for the host, contact the station manager at D-I-C-K at IRLoneStar.com or call the station at 936-647-3776. This show was recorded in downtown Conroe, Texas at the Lone Star Community Radio Studio. And Lone Star Community Radio reserves all rights to this recording and images.